You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. And uh, here we are with uh, Shane, a.k.a. in some circles, The Ruiner, and um, singer with the band Unraveling, and generally just somebody I really like to talk to. So what we're doing is we're going to have a conversation, and you all are invited to kind of sit in and partake of the proceedings. How are you doing this evening, my brother? Wonderful, man. How about yourself? Hey, I'm doing great. It, it's really, really cool we can finally do this. It seems like maybe the time's right. You and I have been talking for quite a while now, privately, and amazing conversations, you know, and kind, of a, kind of a meshing that goes on, you know, personalities and things. I, you know, when I first remember seeing the, the blog, The Ruiner, I'm thinking, God, this guy's probably some kind of kick-ass crazy man or something. And, you know, I get, I get to talking to you, and I find out you're, like, one of the mellowest people I've ever met. And, frankly, you know, one of the deepest people to talk to in terms of a connection, uh, somebody that, um, you know, we kind of we kind of go deep and we're comfortable with each other. And I hope that's always the case, and I hope that's the case for this conversation tonight. So, again, welcome, Shane. And, uh, you know, we kind of scheduled this around, uh, well, we didn't schedule it, did we? We just kind of, it's an impromptu. And I finally just said, what the hell, let's do the conversation, let's record it. And uh, we got a lot of ground probably going to cover tonight, but I don't really have an agenda. I'm just going to kind of open up, you know, a few few topics along the way, and we're going we're gonna to riff through them. But, um, you know, there's some things we probably do need to talk about in terms of this whole theater, this monkey cage called the alternative media. And you kind of kind of sense where I'm going. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to drag. And I, I think I said this before. I don't like dragging people into my jackpots. Um, you know, I've been in this alternative media theater for about 10 years now. And I've seen people come and go, and I've seen the theatrics that people play. And frankly, I've met a hell of a lot of nice people along the way that are sincere and are putting out good information. But um, I think you and I agree that there's something else going on out there in terms of the kind of things that get said and the kind of triggers that are planted and the, the language and the theatrics that is going on. And... I want to steer this as way away from personalities as much as possible, but you know we may name a couple of names along the way here. One of the more disturbing things, and this really goes back, I guess, almost a year now. Certainly around last summer, I remember uh, a lot of discussions that went on in different groups, and part of it was um, centered around what was at the time Cosmic Voice with my friend Thomas Williams your friend as well, somebody that we, we share as an acquaintance, he and, he and his partner, Chloe, about what was being put out um, specifically by Corey Good and David Wilcock and Guy MTV with the disclosures about the Blue Avians and what that really was and how that played into a much darker scenario that was being kind of dangled out there, I think, capriciously and, and recklessly. And at the time, you 
you posted that we needed to be very careful about this, that this was, and, you know, let, I, I try and be accurate, but correct me if I'm wrong, that this was, in fact, a, a government ops project code name uh, being the Blue Avians. And so we kind of went down that road and, you know, it seemed to quiet down for a while, but it was controversial. But here we are again, um, I guess, 10 months later, and now this information is circulating around again via David Wilcock and Corey Good. And, and so, again, we have them dressing up these, these dark code names and these dark secret projects as something, I would say, fairly akin to being some sort of hope for people of this benevolent ET contact thing. You want to, you want to run with any of that? <laughs> well, I mean, going back a year now, um, I've been asked the same sets of questions about a blog I wrote, the, the Avians blog. Specifically, what I said was that it was something that was run as kind of a test. Uh, channelers would have picked it up. Various people in programs would have picked it up. Um, most of them would have known kind of when they got it, that it wasn't real. You know, it would have left an imprint of, of, of not real. But some people did write about it. Some people have talked about it in social circles. It, it got around. And so when I found it coming back around this time, that was kind of when I um, <laughs> got a little bit up, uh, a little concerned with where this could go. Like, why, why now? Why through this channel is this being picked up and broadcast, right? Yeah. Um, into the alternative media is not where it was ever meant to be. It was not, you know, something that was done to mess with the alternative crowd or anything like that. And here, here it is, right? I've avoided the answering the questions mostly out of respect. I've got no personal problems with any of the people involved. Um, I said what I said, not meaning for the the public to hear it right it wasn't i know it was a public blog but again i've explained this before it was intended for a group of my friends that right. knew what i was saying and why right and um everyone else kind of picked it up and used it as a weapon against Corey at the time and that's kind mm -hmm. of what made the ruiner a character in the alternative media so um <laughs> after a full year of avoiding the questions I, I now see that the narrative has gone a complete 180 if we go back to the beginning, these were being sold as a benevolent race, sixth dimensional race coming down, going to save everybody, right? Mm -hmm. It was, that's most recently, now they can't evolve themselves unless we do. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like a narrative we just heard with maybe a mantid race or maybe a reptilian race or other races that, you know, which is isn't that called piggybacking and isn't that something that we should be concerned about and at this point that's why i kind of you know if if people still want to ask that question then i will give an answer to it because that's just wrong you can't after all of this time turn around and to try and twist the hopium that you sold everybody into something else and pretend like nobody's going to notice so what do you perceive as the change in the narrative uh, from the standpoint of the people who are putting this out? Um, I, I think the correction was made and it was made publicly. Obviously, obviously, they used the material that was in your blog, but very publicly, the correction was made on the record about what it was. And so now it comes around again. And this is like... Um, some other people, let's say, that I've made acquaintances with over the years, once they begin to spin the stories, the stories seem to evolve and change and shift. They'll even become contradictory over time. They'll go back and rewrite the narrative in a certain way. Shane, what do you see as the payoff for all of this in terms of putting this information out this way, given that the average person on the street has no clue about what we're talking about. And even within this audience, this is not like, this is not a viral meme on YouTube. It's not being splashed all over millions of web pages, but it is a subculture in a lot of ways. So what do you see here as, as, as the payoff for all this? Depends on what level you want to look at it from, um, from people who may want to, confuse the alternative media 
it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because you're, you're getting people to run around in circles, right? Because this will happen now, and then the next thing you know, there will be another race that comes along, and they're going to save us, and, and we'll go in the same circle, right? Yeah. So there's that. Then there's the, the personal level of the people involved and what they're gaining from it, right? Don't want to speculate as to what that is or is not, but obviously there, there must be something there, right? Yeah. There's this ultimate theme of creating a monster and then saving people from it and promoting whoever is saving them from it and moving on to the next monster, right? So, yeah. It's basically... Endless looping of savior programs is what we've tended to call it. Um, and, you know, I've named the names, the people that want to go look on the website at offplanetradio.com. Just scroll down the page, look at the blog area. And there's some articles there that I put out. And I did name the names. And that's because they're public figures. And scrutiny and criticism is well deserved, just as you know I'm scrutinized. Now you're scrutinized as well because you, you, you know, unfortunately, what happened was you became this reluctant figure in the media as a result of something that you were doing that was almost kind of like a covert operation. And uh, I know it was difficult for you. I know that you sort of resisted it in the beginning. And that, you know, as a result of coming out and being more high profile, you know, there was some pain involved with that. And, you know, people need to know that, that, that uh, the Internet has taken people unawares at times and kind of thrust them into positions that I don't think they were either prepared for or signed up for in the first place. Yep. And, and I know that's the case with you. I mean, we had a lot of conversations about it, you know, the things that happened in different um, well, different groups and uh, the things that happened as a result of, let's say, the back channel that goes on in, in this media outlet. So, you know, you, you've been very kind of controlled about the way you've brought this information out. I would say you've been gracious. And, you know, we want to extend that to people. I, I, was, on, I was on this network, Conscious Consumer Network, on Saturday, and one of the concepts I was trying to explain was the healing that needs to occur with the race, with the human race. And it's not going to come from outside of this race. It's not going to come from aliens or any other type of distant gods or anything like that, that we're responsible for ourselves and for each other. So when we take people on, we also have to we have to hold out the hope that eventually there is reconciliation, that people correct their errors and that they move forward with goodwill towards the others of us out here that are trying to do this work. Do you have any thoughts about that? It's always important to admit when you're wrong, obviously, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Try and make amends if you have to, or uh, correct yourself. Which yeah. is, you know, I've done it. I will continue to do it. If I keep discovering, if I discover again that I'm wrong about something, I will correct it. I've seen you do it. Yeah. Yeah. People should do that. It's it's not it, it's not as difficult or as scary as you may think. You know, people don't they're not going to turn on you for making a mistake. Everybody makes them. If nothing else, then you know it'll it'll humanize you to them, and that's what we should be doing anyways, right? I think a lot of my problem with all of this is just the putting people on pedestals to begin with, and looking up to someone as a as a information source to begin with, yeah. and uh, as being a more important or better than anyone else because there's a lot of information sources out there that, that are saying the same things right if that's information and there's a source for it then there's many sources for that information you can pick and choose who you want to listen to i suppose right everyone has free will everyone can make their own choices i think you should just be aware of what you're choosing and be aware of what you're listening to that's why it's important to question um, your own sources and question yourself question what you're hearing and what you think you're taking from various things yeah yeah and that was kind of the point of it uh, I you know I posted something this morning over on Thomas Williams page just frankly out of fatigue of the divisions that have gone on there and the divisions that have gone on in other groups which is sad to watch and, you know, one of the things that 
people who watch this show listen to it on the podcast to hear the work that you're doing or frankly anybody else in this medium have to understand is that some of us had a mission to communicate information to be facilitators of information which is kind of you know that's kind of been my role over the years is to kind of midwife some pretty at times brutal information but that at the same time, there is a business behind the scenes in some of this that people aren't aware of, the gaming that goes on. And, you know, the paycheck isn't always money. You know, understanding the harvesting of energy, the loose harvesting that's going on, uh, ego gratification, and the ability to influence a, a group of people who are on the kind of the bleeding edge of humanity right now. These are not inconsiderable consequences to the type of games that get played out there and you know, I, I think you know for me it's been you know hopefully one finger pointed out and four pointed back in attempting to be honest with myself about what I do uh, this is you know when I began to talk about some of the things that I experienced I did it after years of asking other people to do that and I was confronted with that I was confronted with it by somebody who came to me and said, look, you clearly have some things that need to be discussed and you may need some help to bring stuff out, but you also have an obligation to be as forthright with the people about who you are and what's going on in your life as the guests that you've had on. And that was actually kind of a cleansing situation. It was a psychic named Betsy Lewis who brought me onto her show. And I just, you know, I told her what I knew and no more than that. It, it's, it was simple. Okay. This is my story. This is what I think happened. That's it. I'm not going to embellish it. I don't have a linear narrative. A lot of the things in these circumstances don't make nice, tight stories and packages. Very true. Um, I'm not sure what people think they, I'm not sure what people expect really when people are telling these stories to them in terms of it all being coherent, right? Because for us, it's not. It's, you know, I, we can't present it to you as coherent because for us, it's not. We no. we can only give it to you as clearly as we've figured it out for ourselves. And none of us have got it figured out perfectly clear. I mean, do you have, does any, even if you've never had experiences like this, do you have your whole life figured out perfectly clearly no you don't right like there's memories that are fuzzy there's things that you don't think about or didn't remember or uh, i don't know if there's the expectations are really high and i i guess it's it's good that the expectations are high because it means that people are questioning and that's very important but i think that um as long as everybody's being honest with themselves and trying to be as clear as we can, that's really all we can do. Yeah. Like, I, I, can, I can tell you what I believe is true and tell you at the same time that it may not be true. It's just what I believe is true, right? Yeah. It's, and, and I'm not going to tell you it's not true just because I can't prove to you that it's true if I believe that it's true. If you don't want to hear me say that it's true, don't ask me whether or not it's true. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, me no question. Hell, yeah, it's kind of like, why in the hell are we even talking here? Yeah, you know, exactly. I, like, I, like I said, you know, in a couple of shows, um, we'd like to tie everything up with bows. And, and, you know, like you and I have talked now for, you know, several months behind the scenes. I've done that with a lot of other people, people who I, it may take me a year sometimes to interview someone. And that's just, you know, that's just the weird kind of convoluted nature of what I do. I have a lot of people I'm talking to, and I know you do as well. And quite honestly, the most honest conversations sometimes are the ones you have with yourself when you go, God, I, I listen to myself and I'm not even sure I would believe me. You know, you go through the loop of thinking, could I be wrong about this? Am I imagining this? Is this delusional? I mean, there's, there's a psychic break that takes place as you're examining yourself. And those are some of the most healthy responses in terms of vetting this information on a gut level to yourself. Because if you don't believe it, you shouldn't talk about it 
And you should not ever believe that you know the whole truth about anything because we're not even objective observers of our own realities. Nope. <laughs> it's an amazing uh, thing. I've, I've never met a being that knows everything. There's, I just don't think that it's, it exists, you know, like uh, even on the inside, there's no one person who knows everything <laughs> on the outside. There's no one person who knows anything, no one yeah. being who knows any, everything. Uh, there's no one version of history that's 100% correct. There's no nope. one version of anything that's 100% correct because everything is so... <clears throat> it all depends on the observers, right? And the observers have influences not only on what's being observed, but how it's being interpreted and then how it's being written down. So... Yeah. You know, that's a, we all played telephone in kindergarten, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, you know, and we have to be circumspect about all of that. The honest communication is me bouncing things off you, you bouncing things off me. You know, with the comfort level that at some point you can go, you know, I'm not so sure about that, or I disagree, or I think that's bullshit. And I mean, to me, the people that I like the best are the people who are the most transparent in terms of either me or themselves. It's an internal honesty that reflects back out into the relationship. I mean, the communities that you and I kind of interact with, Shane, are heavily laced with empaths and people who are sensitives of, of some nature or another. Mm -hmm. And um, I've watched a lot of the empaths over the years, and some of those people are friends of yours who have gone through excruciating situations and heartbreak, and I mean, just kind of everyday pain and fear that, that every human being experiences, the dark nights of the soul, but then they, they kind of bounce back out of it again with a heightened perception, usually with a greater sensitivity as well, because I mean, I know some of the people that you talk to and I talk to, there's times when I'm talking to these people that my solar plexus gets warm. I feel what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Those, to me, are genuine conversations that come from the heart that people need to hear, which, you know, again, it's kind of like why we're talking tonight like this, because I'm hoping that as we go through this conversation tonight, maybe we spark a little bit of that and can kind of push it out there, because it really is the kind of communication that needs to occur now. Well, there's two aspects to it. There's you being comfortable enough to tell me, you know what, I think that that's bullshit. Right? And, <laughs> and there's me being comfortable enough to hear you say that and not take it personally. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like not become offended by it. Yeah. Not, you know, not mean that we can't be friends because you think that what I just said was bullshit or, right. or you, you know what I mean? Not that, you know, or the idea is bullshit or what have you. It, that's part of communication that we need to relearn and to be able to, communicate all of these different things with each other because that's the only way we're ever going to put together anything that's coherent is by putting all the puzzle pieces back together right if it if yeah. the puzzle puzzle is spread out between all of us then the only way to make a clear picture is to communicate you know one of the things that we've we've talked about and you you wrote about this in your blogs and it's sort of one of those central themes because of who you are and where you came from is the concept of telepathy and being able to mentally perceive people around you at various stages and levels. And <clears throat> we're now living in this time that we've got this escalating energetic that's occurring in humanity. It is a, it is a bloody struggle. I mean, this thing is like, you know, maybe I, I think I probably shared this with, with you before. I, I've shared it with the listeners. I knew all this stuff was coming when I was a kid. I was told this. I would have never expected what I have seen so far and what I believe is yet to come as, you know, the necessary steps for humanity to just move forward a few inches at a time because that's what we've been doing. You know, right now, as a race, we are sort of the baby step phase of waking, waking up, um, advancing consciousness, which is occurring on a seed level in the race itself. And we're dealing 
with the fallout that, that comes from that, the, the, the wild shifts that are going on, um, the interactions that I think we have with our own emotions, as well as the motions and emotions of the galactic and universal movements that are occurring. And those, those amplified forces right now make everything that we talk about in this show tonight, you know, probably a little more precarious because we want to be careful. We want to lean on the side of grace in terms of the people that are out there. And I'm not blowing smoke here. I, I, the more I interact with people and I find people who are genuine and real, um, I value that because I realize how rare it is in the culture right now. Almost any of the narratives that are playing right now have one thing in common, and that is that it's kind of a time of making choices within yourself and doing work within yourself and, and being able to project that work or be able to project that image out into the world. Um, if, if we follow that, then it doesn't really matter what narrative you follow it, if, you, if you just look at it that deep. At the same time, you've got to be conscious of where that energy is going you know what i mean like you part of making choices and part of being self-responsible is understanding how you're generating energy and where that energy yeah. goes once you've generated it yeah. and and if you're opening vectors and just show throwing things around all willy-nilly you're not helping anybody especially yourself and it you know helping others starts with yourself so let's start there let's, let's control what, how we're how we're throwing this energy around and what we're doing as amplifiers to this energy. And that comes with a lot of responsibility. You know, it comes with the responsibility of what you're putting back out in terms of what you say to others, what you're um, regurgitating in terms of information, um, how you're handling your own situations and interactions with other people. It's, it's all part of making choices. Every, every one of those is a choice. And that's what we mean when we say that it's a time of choice. So you're, you've got to, it's almost like we're proving ourselves to the universe at this point. It's humanity's time to kind of step up and prove themselves to themselves and, and show that our nature isn't what we've been showing for the last few thousand years, that we're better than that, that we, we're capable of more. Everything we believe about ourselves, we just need to start being and, and not worry about uh, ETs coming to harm us or save us or the financial system um, crashing or changing or resetting or um, so-and-so bringing out funds from whereabouts and and <laughs> distributing it back to whatever the hell yeah, yeah. and you know it, none of this stuff needs to be where the focus is the focus needs to be on the energy the focus needs to be on how we're handling ourselves amongst ourselves and how we're treating the planet everything that we're doing is a choice choose wisely that's where we're at right now it's interesting. The divisions continue. We think it's just within our small circle. And I'll bring this up because it's kind of been in the front of my mind. Um, Tom, Tom DeLong of uh, Blink-182 has been now going very public about his belief in UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence. And, you know, he's, he joins a pretty long list, frankly, in my research of, of musicians and specifically people in the rock community going back to John Lennon and Jimi Hendrix in terms of a kind of soft disclosure that's occurred in music. I've gone back through album titles and music tracks for 40 years and been able to find where these little confessions have kind of been sneaked into things. And, and then uh, I heard Dr. Stephen Greer, who's the, the well, the Disclosure Project, basically, and this is going somewhere in the context of what we've been talking about, but Greer is really taking DeLong to task over his perception that DeLong thinks that the aliens are malevolent and talking about intelligence agency operations. And Greer, of course, has obviously espoused the policy for a long time that all aliens, all ETs are benevolent and that um, disclosure is imminent. 
Now, in that range of remarks somewhere, it has less to do with the perception of conflict. I have not been able to find where Tom, Tom DeLong has really said anything about malevolent ETs per se. He's sort of at the level where I think he's experienced something. I don't think he's quite talked about it yet. And I, I, I know that he's been out there looking. He's looking, you know, when you go looking for something, you have, you're, you're looking because you sense something is already there. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Greer, to his credit, did a lot to bring a lot of this to the forefront. He was an experiencer himself as a young Still person. And, and, it, and it, to me, it's kind of sad to see the loggerheads that people are coming to over a topic that we're still attempting to even bring into the alternative media in a, in a meaningful way. I mean, this is, this is material that when I started to do this, you know, once you step into certain things, you don't look back. You, there's no turning back. And I had people ask me, why are you doing this? You know, you were on shortwave radio. You were doing Christian broadcasting. Now, and my answer to that is I had questions And my questions weren't answered by that venue. I spent a lot of time there. My spirituality isn't necessarily defined by something that you put a title on. But there was a point where I connected what I was searching for to a spiritual quest and understanding that the questions inside of me were part of the questions that a lot of other people were also asking of themselves and then going out and doing, well, finding the other people out there, finding the other souls out there who were searching as well. And so, you know, listening to Dr. Greer and, and reading Tom DeLong's remarks and seeing his Twitter feed and his Facebook page, uh, he represents what I would call the high end of the middle right now in terms of people that are searching. This the subject of the extraterrestrial race is, is fraught with peril because it seems that every time people make pronouncements about it one way or another, there is something that goes in an opposite direction. So people want to know, well, how many races are they? Are they good? Are they bad? Are they abducting? Are they anal probing? You know, are, um, uh, how did they get here? You know, there's, there's a thousand different questions. And you wrote about this from, I will say, probably a more expansive view in the Ruiner blog. But what would you tell somebody who's asking fundamental questions about the existence of extraterrestrial races and what we can know in terms of what their intentions are or may be? There's no one intention there's you know there's it's got to be lots of different groups right like um you can have a conversation with someone at a coffee shop about what people are like in a country that you don't live in and and make some generalities about the way that they think or the way that they act or the way that Mm -hmm. they are or what they believe or something like that that's on the same planet as you right <laughs> that's that, that's that's literally like miles away from you what if we're talking about a different galaxy and a, a different part of space you don't think that that still stands you don't think that on another planet way out there that the difference between chicago and germany is a big difference right on that planet too right and i mean let's let's just say that an entire planet this entire planet tomorrow had the ability to go wherever they wanted and interact with whatever races they could find out there i mean the people from the united states who did it and the people from africa who did it it would be presenting themselves in much different ways to whoever they were making contact with but still saying that they came from the same planet Right. So I think it's it's too big of a question to paint with all one brush. You've got way too many people, way too many agendas, way too many ideologies, way too many beliefs, way too many possibilities to ever say they're all good. They're all bad. They're all benevolent. They're all benevolent. They're all this. They're all that. It's you know, you, you can't say that for Palladians. You can't say that for Andromedans. You can't say that from 
for humans. You can't say that for anybody. So to say all ETs are all benevolent, that's insane. To say that they're all benevolent is equally insane. It just doesn't make any sense. So the, that entire approach to the subject doesn't, it's not helping, right? Like you've, you've got to, um, I've personally heard so many stories and out of maybe a hundred stories, you might find five that actually match up to say like, that's probably the same type of experience, yeah. but there's so many different types of experiences out there. There's so many different ways those experiences can be um, perceived as well. So it's, making those type of generalities is is a mistake that I think too many people are trying to make by and I'm not even sure what's driving us to make them to be honest like I question what what is it that drives Stephen Greer to try and tell people that they're all anything right I I don't understand that and I think that's that's almost like the the root question to unraveling that whole mystery is right is fi yeah. figuring out what why people are trying to make these statements to begin with why are you trying to put a stamp of authority on anything when you really don't know and you should know if if, if you know what you say you know you should know that you don't know <laughs> you know oddly enough i understood that <laughs> i completely yeah. got that but that's that's it like I, I think about that all the time like it's i i think it's been said in other ways like the the more i know the the more i realize i don't know much at all right and yeah you know, that's for anyone who's been in any kind of black ops secret societies anything that's not public knowledge they should know that much <laughs> that the lie is different yeah. as every level as Richard Holdeblind is famous for right. saying and that uh, it, the more you learn the more you realize that everything you just believed was probably all bullshit and you probably don't know the truth still because guess what there's another level above you and therefore if you know what you say you know you should know that <laughs> no no it's true and, and at the same time you're going but i'm not all right with that i really want to know i i i you know and everybody does we all do um, that's why we have to talk to each other yeah like that's why we have yeah. to p compare notes as they say and um as soon as you take the ego out of that of like my information being more correct or more incorrect than yours or any of that type of drama that we like to insert into these conversations it becomes a lot easier and we can actually objectively look at all of these things and say hey well maybe this is what's going on or maybe this is what's going on well maybe let's look at that 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 means that this can't be going on so perhaps it's this you know like these are the kind of conversations we need to be able to have that I think we're stepping into now. Like I think that we're we're finally at a place now where there's enough information out there. We've all had enough time to look at it and absorb some of it and kind of come to a basic understanding of what we think is going on that when we're communicating with each other it's just it's kind of like just filling in the missing pieces and it's starting to starting to improve, I think. Hopefully we can help that. Yeah. And and that's really the point of you know, both the, the, the private conversations that we have and then doing something like this, because, you know, again, iron sharpens iron. It's a, you know, it's a great saying. I mean, it, I, I fire off you, you fire off of me. We're kind of, we, we reach a place where we can open our communications. We open our perceptions. It's an arrogance to think that, you know, much of anything about anything, much less everything about it all. Yes. The vastness of it. And at the same time, what I was attempting to communicate this in, 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 in my post out on to uh, Thomas's group was, look, you know, we've put our fate in the hands of people thinking that they would save us, the savior program that we talked about earlier. We continue to hold out hopes and then we're disappointed when the next next shoe drops and somebody else falls somebody's not credible anymore somebody's found out to you know engage in, in a bit of scumbaggery and 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 felonious behavior and and yet you know we do we have to look at this and realize that we're human we're flawed and we also are struggling on a human level to deal 
was an all encompassing reality that it feels like we were dropped into this planet with total amnesia, total blackout and left to grope around in the dark to figure out who we are in this world, much less our place out there, which it feels to me is where we belong at some point. I mean, even if we just listen to what we're saying, like we're, we're talking about memories being altered, we're talking about, you know, not remembering things, we're talking about um, programs designed to make us think one thing when another thing is true. But then we try and turn around and act like we're an authority on any one of these programs when we, yeah. what are these programs? They're deceptions, right? You're, so what are we, an authority on a deception? That doesn't really make sense, does it? Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, and take it a step further, most of them are simulations. Most of the things that we think we're going through in these programs, we're not actually doing. We're going through a very, very advanced simulation. And if that's the case, then... <laughs> How can we be authority on that, <laughs> right? Like, what, what what type of authority? Just because you've gone through it, like, yes, you can relay your experiences. Your experiences is yours. You own that. And it's beautiful and it's powerful. It is all that it is. But that's that's for you. That's your experience. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you can share that with another person, but you can't expect it to be that for them, because it's not their experience. Right? There's a lot of people out there in this community who listen to these stories and they would love to believe them and they, they try to believe them or they do believe them or whatever, but they've never had those experiences themselves. And so therefore, there's always a part of it that's never real to them. Right? Mm -hmm. Only makes sense. If you've never experienced it, then you can only go so far with your, your belief into it. Unless you've had other experiences that just make that easier to believe as well, right? But this is this is where we're all at, and to try and act like anyone's an authority on any one thing. I mean, you and I could have been in the same project and grown up together and have full memory of knowing each other every day for 17 years in a project and meet up 10 years later and talk about that project. We're still going to have different ideas of what the fuck went on. That's exactly right. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Um, we're still going to think, you know, it, two people can witness a car crash and report different things you know it's there's too there's too many variables to act like you're the authority and try and be the authority on something so in, in the scale of that i want to back up a little bit to the to the d word this this you know there's 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 a couple of memes that float around out there um and people who have listened to me for a long time know that I have my pet peeves about things, and, and one of them is Nasara the and the CVs and the idea that um, we're going to liberate enough gold to finance people being free somehow. And then there's this idea of disclosure. The, the day that the cameras come on and a man steps out of the shadows, presumably, presumably a president of the United States or a world leader and they're going to go okay so here's what we know and you're going to be briefed on 50 100 years 200 years 2000 years of the presence of beings from other worlds on this planet and that's what people were looking for and it's amazing to me shane to see how they've never really done the research to see what lies even in our ancient past that tells us truths about ourselves but we don't we don't want to deal with that you've kind of gone on the record pretty publicly and said look you know disclosure is not going to happen no nope, we're gonna i've said it before i call it the path of discoveries got that phrase from somewhere i didn't come up with it myself and it's going to be just kind of you know it's the same idea as a soft disclosure a drip free disclosure you know just kind of letting things go into the public all of a sudden elon musk going coming out and saying that we all live in a simulation uh that you know they, <laughs> that's <laughs> fucking awesome <laughs> i know all these different things that they keep dropping on us like oh now we can 3d print an organ hey 
that, you know, we're, yeah. we're, 3D printing is replicator technology. Like it's, you know, it, it, that is disclosure, right? And and the bottom line is all that information is already out. You know, we've, that's, you know, your radio show is dedicated to the fact that the, all that information is actually already out, right? Like we don't, we don't need them to tell us. We, it's almost like we just need them to admit it. And then you have to ask yourself, well, what do we need them to admit it for? What do we need their authority stamp on it for it's not for us it's so that we can turn to all the people who think that we're crazy and go see told you so right but if that's really all that's ever going to happen if that's really all that all that you get from that what what is that it's not much and so what's the point of it what's the point of dwelling on whether or not it's going to happen or not is what i mean what it, you know yeah. already right if you know already then you don't need someone to come along and tell you that you know already. Start living like you know already. That would be my answer. <laughs> no, but that is the seed. That's the seed right there. You know, you know and yet you don't know. There's knowing and unknowing. Unknowing is a part of knowing because you know, well, you go, you go into the infinite loop at that point. It's breathing. It's in and out. Yeah, it's in and out. It's the... Inhale and exhale and the pulsations of a universe that expands and grows. What's amazing to me is the stream of reality viewed from, you know, my years on the planet uh, of how plastic it all really is anyway. You know, we perceive a thing and the thing seems to change. We imagine a thing. We manifest a thing. We do this all the time. This is what's incredible to me. People talk about manifestation like it's some uh, juggernaut. It's not. We do it all the time, and yet people don't understand that they are manifesting on a constant scale, that everything around them is a physical materialization of a thought form. And, and you know... When you get to the level where you start to understand that, and you know, I don't want to be frustrated with people over this because I get it. You know, I look at the state of humanity right now. I look at the desperation. I look at the poverty, the death, and all the things that are going on in this world. And I understand the desire to change that. But again, we come back again to the savior programs and why that exists and why we have this gigantic media circus Let's talk a little bit about manifestation and, and how, how you think that works. Because I know you do it in your life. You're an artist. And it's a, that's a critical part of being an artist. You are literally pulling things out of your head and putting them out there energetically. Mm -hmm. And even ties into the telepathy topic. But um, Yeah, it does. And go there. Uh, well, because <laughs> the thing like... I've said, I think I've, I may have said it before, but telepathy, everyone thinks about it like sending a dialogue back and forth. It's, it's more of a sending an imagery back and forth or mm -hmm. sending, sending concepts and ideas back and forth than it is actually words. It's not kind of like you hear words in your head. It's you see a scene, you, you catch it, and it happens really quickly, and it's pretty interesting. But that is manifesting, right? Like that is taking what's in here and pushing it out there consciously and it's something that we as any kind of being have the ability to do whether we deny it of ourselves or not the some one analogy i like to give people is we all saw it in high school where there was that one guy who is just he just wasn't a good person you know he did, but everyone you know seemed to like him anyways and he seemed to be successful anyways and he you know he just he was arrogant he was egotistical and he would full of himself and all of these things. God, that guy went to your school too? Well, he oh, went to man. everybody's school. Yeah, right? of we, course We've all seen it, and that's why it's a, yeah. it's a useful analogy, because that guy, he was successful. How, how is that possible, right? He's treating people like garbage, but somehow he's still managing to become successful. How does that work? That's manifesting. It's that be belief that he has in himself almost transcends the shitty karma that he's picking up for being bad to people and and manifests into his world su the success that he's striving for because he believes that he deserves it right 
and I think that like the, the kind of mind control and lie that we've we've all taught ourselves is that we don't deserve things and we don't deserve you know love and we don't deserve abundance and we don't deserve anything that it is that we want that we have to somehow you know suffer for past mistakes and we're not we're not allowed to have it but that's 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 where the manifestation comes in is is understanding that there does have to you can't kind of go willy-nilly and just manifest whatever you want just because you want it but you, you can put your energy behind something that you actually do need and want in your life because you you need to achieve something in your life and that want will allow you to achieve it and it will manifest for you it's it's not a perfect science in this particular reality um i think that's because some natural laws have been broken but anyways uh but it's it's a good thing to practice nonetheless everything's energy everything is i like to say it's all just music it's all a frequency it's all rotation it's all notes right so when I'm coming up with notes in music and I want to make you feel what I feel, then I'm going to pick notes that make me feel that, right? I'm going to find the notes that make me feel this, and I'm going to make that real for you when you listen to it, hopefully. That's at least what I'm going for. And that's, that's a form of manifestation. There's so many aspects to it, and I think where people might get hung up is they're kind of looking for a instant gratification with it a lot of the time, and a, most of the time it's a, a kind of cumulative energy that you've put towards something that will make it manifest, so it does take time, or it does take energy, or focus, or whatever you want to call the, the energy that amount of energy that you end up having to give to it. But you can do it, and you just, you know, it's, it all comes back to convincing your mind that something is real, right? Like the imagination and will creating magic, psychology, this is all just making it real for the mind, and it manifests. That's how everything works within a hologram, whether it's a synthetic hologram or a organic hologram. So um, it's a good thing to wrap your mind around. <laughs> I was told... A long time ago, when I was questioning and I had the ear of some people who I considered at the time to be wise, and they were, and they taught me some things, and they taught me, you know, some errors as well, that one of the reasons why we are in time is because time is a mechanism to delay this instant manifestation, yeah, this instant manifestation which is the purview of what we would probably call the gods, which I don't deny that that's a whole other trajectory. That's something that over the years I've pursued a little bit with Duncan O'Finian, when we've talked about the pantheon of, uh, for instance, the North Norse gods, Odin. Um, you can go now and look at some of the, the movies that are being made and I'm talking about specific, specifically Thor was a movie where you saw a little bit of that. But that, you know, if you want to call it the curse of man, the fall of man, whatever happened in our distant past, for whatever reason, we were not given immediate abilities to manifest and simply shoot our energy out there and bam, it's done because of the potential destructive energy inherent in that and the immaturity of the entities at that particular time and development. So that's kind of always been my core understanding of that. Do you agree with that? Do you disagree? Is there something that's missing in that equation? I think that I, I've heard it as well. Um, it's definitely a theory that is uh, well adopted uh, for a variety of people that I know. Um, when I consider it, what I, if that's true, I think that the reason would be anyways, or what I've kind of concluded that the, the reason probably is, is we are so emotional. We have such a wide range of emotion, such yeah. a wide spectrum, such a wide potential for emotions. And if we're not processing those emotions properly while thinking, um, 
I go back to the trivia method and, and different schools. Then we, it, it could be dangerous, right? Because we we like we see it in society all of the time. Like we're seeing it right now in various parts of the world and in big, highly publicized events like the migrants and stuff like this, where people are becoming very reactive. And it's you know, it's because they're so emotional about something. It's because an emotion is driving that reaction, and whether it's a the right in their in their feeling like their emotion or not is almost irrelevant because they're not controlling their action in a balanced way. And I think that if that's true, if that's, that's what's happened to humanity or that's what the fall of humanity truly is, that makes sense because of the fact that I, I see it everywhere. You know, like I, I see people not being able to put their thoughts and emotions together correctly in order to have a good in output into the world yeah my gosh let's just look at road rage as an example you're you're hurling a car example. down a highway at 65 70 miles an hour and somebody flips you off and i have seen people do it you know and i felt it myself as well there's a triggering that occurs and all that but you know you're now dealing with you know four or five thousand pound machine underneath you with a lot of horsepower and the potential to theoretically really f somebody up and all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, that's, that's a visceral response that came from inside me that has really lethal consequences if pursued. It's true. I mean, like going back to disclosure, one part of the disclosure that people seem to want is kind of like a bringing all these people to the, the town square and hanging them, you know, yeah. like that's, that's, and that's the type of reaction I'm talking about, you know, like that's all that's really doing is perpetuating the same type of behavior. Right. And if, if, is that what we want to do? Probably not. So maybe, maybe we need to reconsider how we feel about these, about these things before we act on them. Yes, punishment, you know, our repercussions are in order, but maybe publicly hanging them just because that's what we felt, feel in the moment isn't the way to go, right? So there's lots of different scenarios where we're tested in that way. We're, we're put into situations all the time where, you know, someone's pissing you off and you have to bite your tongue or someone's making you overly happy and you don't want to show that because maybe you're, you know, in the middle of a business deal and you don't want to play all your cards at once. Like there's, there's so many scenarios. And, and I think that that's, that's part of coming to know yourself. And that's why, you know, all of the spiritual teachings tell us to go within is because that's where you learn how to do that. You learn how to process those feelings in a healthy way. Going back to music, I have bad things that have happened to me in my life and negative emotions that come from that. And so I do heavy music where I get to scream and I get to sing about those things in an environment that's suiting of those topics. And I get to process it in that way that doesn't hurt anybody. Right. <laughs> Nothing hey, speaking of that, else. speaking of that, I look at the clock and we're ha we're halfway through, and so why don't we take a break at this point? Um, we're going to play some music on the break here for the folks who will be watching this on the network, and uh, we're going to play some unraveling music. Tell the listeners, the viewers, a little bit about the unraveling project, your band, what's going on with that, where they can find you, and then. Uh, Maybe just a little bit about the piece of music we're, we're going to play this video. Well, um, the band is called Unraveling. Uh, I think that I was actually just talking to a band member the other day, and I realized that in every conversation I have in, in the alternative media, that, that word gets repeated over and over again, Unraveling, Unraveling, Unraveling. <laughs> it's actually quite funny um, because I, I – 
some people say unveiling, I say unraveling. It's both the same idea. We're in a time where energy is changing our, our reality and it's changing the way that we're going to be able to interact with our reality. And we are unraveling. You are unraveling. We, um, we do music that's kind of heavier. It's uh, similar to like the Nine Inch Nails meets Lincoln Park meets System of a Down type type ballpark. Uh, this particular song, Tangled Hope, is about kind of my relationship. I actually say at one point a dance that I have with being hopeful about the future and our ability to to do better and the dark days where I don't have that same type of hope because we're all we all have those days, right? So we do. Um, yeah. yeah. And if so you that, end up, yeah, yeah go. go. That, that's it. That's that's yes. what we do. There we go. So um, we're going to listen to Tangled Hope from Unraveling during the break, and we'll be back in a
And we're back for the second half of Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, and we are here with Shane, or a.k.a. The Ruiner. But uh, we prefer to call him Shane because we don't really know the Ruiner guy. Um, you, uh, you've now seen the video and uh, experienced the music a little bit of uh, Shane's band and what he's doing, which is, you know, this is performance art. It's video. It's music. It's theater. There's a lot of embedded things that go into it. And the part that I really wanted to talk to you about was music, the creative process, what inspires you, what it means to you. I listen to this kind of music, and it it really does take me back. Uh, I grew up on the in the age of the birth of heavy metal. You know, in the 70s, I remember going to see Black Sabbath and just the incredible energy that Ozzy and Tommy and the guys were imparting on stage. It was dark. It was theatrical. And at the same time, when you go back and you listen to the music, you listen to a song like War Pigs, um, there's something there. There was something in it that, that was a, a heart for humanity. And <clears throat> Ozzy's image aside, you know, it was very clear that they were communicating things that then were out in the culture. Your influences, which include Nine Inch Nails and Tool, as two major influences, are obviously bands that tap into the pulse of the culture from a perspective of another generation, the reality that you grew up with and the things that we're dealing with now. And some of it's timeless and some of it is of its own generation. Talk a little bit about how you tap into this and what it, what it inspires in you. Well, I guess for me, um, it was a, a lot of it was timing wise. I think it was kind of the early mid to late nineties that a lot of that music was coming out like the nine inch nails and, and tool and rage against the machine. And a lot of these bands were, it, it was a different type of sound, right? Like Nirvana had, had changed the things even from a mainstream perspective and, and that had trickled down to more people listening to heavier music and then a lot of different genres of music. I mean, heavy metal splintered into a, a thousand different genres of music, right? So uh, a lot of different things started coming out. And um, for me personally, I mean, I, I grew through school and stuff. I used to do a lot of like performing like uh singing in musicals plays stuff like that i really loved uh like i'd sing disney songs and stuff like that i still uh i i've actually opened a, a show with a song from aladdin before so um uh, i really liked some david bowie stuff because i saw him in labyrinth and then um when i saw started getting into heard nine inch nails and I think that was Nine Inch Nails was really the first one that did it for me. I can't remember the lyrics, but it was there was lyrics that were triggering things that I had experienced, right? Like it was almost like a narrative, like the way I put it is it was almost like I wrote the lyrics and it, it had a, a very profound effect on me. Yeah. And I and I started listening to it just to try and see if there was any more of that. And I remember at first I couldn't even stand the music. Like it was kind of just noise that I was listening through to try and pick out what he's saying. And then the next thing you knew, I was falling in love with all of the different type of noise. And I was realizing why he was putting those words to those noises because that was how it was making me feel. Um, you know, so I, I think that's where it came from for me originally. I, in that particular period is where I decided that being in a band and, and singing was something that I wanted to do. Um, I realized that a lot of people were getting away with saying things that I would like to be able to say and, and didn't feel like I was going to get away with saying anywhere else through music by re reading lyrics. You know, you, you mentioned some of that as well, where it was like people have been dropping things in songs all through the sixties and seventies. And even if you go back further, you know, you can go into some, uh, Oh, I think it's been there forever. I think yeah, it's that like Roy, Roy Orbison of all people. Like, Roy Orbison. Um, <laughs> go back and listen to Mozart, for instance, yeah. the magic flute. Yeah. Listen to Moonlight Sonata. And, yeah. and you know, you understand. Going beyond words. Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it may be the, the lyrics that are explicit or it may be what they're wrapped in when you were talking about the noise and a little bit of both. Nine, yeah. Yeah. Nine Inch Nails came out of that, the industrial sound that was, that was coming out. And that really kind of emerged out of what Bowie did with his Berlin albums, low specifically, and this new technology that we had. The, the synthesizers, the vocoders, the samplers. Digital all, recording. Yeah, digital recording. Um, all of a sudden, you're in a different domain. I mean, we grew up in the age of um, magnetic tape, for instance, and the ability to limitedly multi-track. I remember, I remember when I was 17, saving up enough money to buy a TAC reel-to-reel tape deck, four-track. And to actually be able to do, on some limited scale, then a certain amount of overdubbing, which was a sophisticated toy for a kid. Mm -hmm. And listening to the recordings of that era. But when we get to the digital era, all of a sudden, things change very quickly. Um, There is something about digital, whether we're using computers to communicate or word process or crunch numbers or sample and transcode music, we are basically creating in a domain defined by the medium itself, which goes back to Marshall McLuhan and the things that he talked about in the 60s. You know, he was referring to television specifically, film a little bit in print and what happened in those years. But we're, we're, we're now what I call post-literate in the sense that the written word to me seems not as important as the YouTube video that's in front of most people's faces today or the blurbs on Facebook. But music has a way to encapsulate things in ways because it's Mm multidimensional. And so, you know, Nine Inch Inch Nails is a great example of that because they took this emerging industrial thing and Reznor, because of who he is, and who we suspect he he is and where he's been and who let's just say he works for um which isn't new and it's not it's not a recrimination against him um brings into the dimension again this darkness and this catharsis that goes on inside the artist which is a lot of what you're doing it's what i saw in that video it's what i hear when i listen to your music well, we all have it, right? Like we all, um, you know, like thoughts bump into your head that you don't even mean to think, right? Like the, 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 the mind's a funny thing and, and influences environmental and otherwise are, are all factors in what bounces around in your head and things can get stuck in there and it's not healthy to just let things fester. So it's always good to find some type of outlet. It, you know, music is mine. Uh, maybe yours is painting or you know, driving. Uh, there's there's so many different varieties of ways that you can use to process different types of energy, but having an outlet is so important and a creative outlet that allows you to express yourself as well. You know, um, a phrase when it comes to Nine Inch Nails, I remember reading in Rolling Stone that has always stuck with me was that as much as Trent Reznor is screaming, fuck you, he's always also whispering, love me. Right. And that's true. That's true. That's the, that's, you know, that's the the part of the artist that I think that we all get drawn to and relate to. And, um, you know, with, with all of our favorite artists, whoever it is for you personally, you, you relate to something within them that's true to you. And I don't know, there's, you know, martial arts, there's, um, creating video games, there's making movies, there's a million different creative outlets out there and, and flavors. Um, but music seems to be something that almost all of us can get into. I think everyone, like the, the majority of people have a musical artist that they love or a type of music that they listen to all of the time. And I think that goes back to what I was saying about everything being frequency and music. Right. So, um, I think that certain artists started actually, not that that 
that information was new or the, the tactic was new or the, uh, the tactic makes it sound dirty. Um, the, the, the method was new, but figured out again, how to use music to make people feel things and, and kind of draw where people's attentions going in, um, I guess esoteric ways or ways that have been occulted from public knowledge for a long time. Uh, going back, they, they've changed the tuning of music. They've changed, you know, they've uh, the common uh, time signatures. Con changed. Yeah. Um, Concert pitch, time signatures. Everything. Like, and then they moved us into digital, yeah. which um, if, if you want a kind of good idea of what we lost in that or what changed in that, watch the documentary Sound City with David Gruel of Foo, Foo Fighters. It's great. It's, he, that's a great documentary. Yeah. It's, it's a great documentary. It just kind of shows what happened to music once we moved away from analog yeah. to digital and, and what we may have may have lost because I mean it is a kind of a taste thing right like we 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 could just be guilty of doing the same thing our parents did with all kids today in their music right but uh, at the same time I do think that something was lost on a frequency level when we moved into the digital domain I do think that that's on purpose I wrote a blog about it called digital burning um, and I, I do think that it would be nice to get some of it back you know to to get back to you know uh, non-digital recording once in a while I, I i wish that we could spin our knowledge of technology into to making that a possibility again right but anyways uh going off topic a little no it wasn't off to topic at all it actually captures something there that um i've you've you've you actually echoed something that's been a pet peeve of mine from another direction and, and that's been digital photography um because that was one of my muses as well and i mean I have thousands of, of uh, negatives and transparency slides that I shot from the time I was about 14 years old. And I was, had a time where I was trained by a photographer who learned the art in Switzerland and came back and taught me how to shoot, how to develop, how to print, how to dodge film, how to do special effects in the camera, all of those things. And, you know, I had a pretty good rig at one point and... You know, the digital era came in and all of a sudden, all of the things that we had done either optically or chemically or mechanically somehow became possible inside of a box with chips. Mm -hmm. And overnight, there was an explosion. You know, it's the good side and the bad side. It's like the music industry imploded. Well, what a bunch of geniuses. Let's release all of our new music in a digital format at the exact same time that we're bringing computers out. Now, I'm wondering, at the time, I'm thinking, who didn't see this? Well, you know, what were they thinking? Yeah. So the next thing you get is you get Napster and the MP3, and you have this proliferation of piracy, so-called file sharing, but people forget the tax that was levied on cassette tapes for people like me who bought music mm -hmm. and recorded it onto cassette tapes to take in my car because really, the, you know, the vinyl thing just doesn't work in a car going 65 miles an hour. It doesn't work. <laughs> <clears throat> so we always seem to gain something and lose something in the process. I've always said that the resolution of pixels inside of a camera or on a screen, regardless of how expanded they become, and they become very sophisticated, doesn't approximate the grains of silver in the emulsions of the finest ectochrome film that was ever made. There's a certain magic there, and we lost the magic. And that's really what we're talking about, whether we're talking about photography or music, or any of these organic creative processes is we're bringing something out, but we're putting it into a medium. And that medium itself, again, like McLuhan said, seems to define the outcome in some way. It does. Um, magic is, well, rituals. This is where it's I wanted to go, by the way. You're walking yeah. right into it. This is beautiful. <laughs> Magic and ritual, it's, it's convincing the mind that it's real, right? Like we're, we're doing that. And, mm -hmm. and a song can be just as, as much a ritual as the dance that goes along with it. Um, 
in a way like it, it's the same thing as if you paint a picture a person can get you get staring at the picture you get lost in the picture you can start picturing yourself within the picture you can you know if if you've got a wild enough imagination you can feel the breeze you know you can you, you can do these things and and music opens up those doors as well um it also opens up doors for people to start um influencing you in that way as well right and um any artist is trying to influence you so um it, you know uh, whether their intentions are to try and violate you or not they're still trying to influence you so um huh i, I guess where we're kind of go stepping into is the the kind of agenda between the the, the digital um the kind of killing off of the music industry because you can't think that they didn't like you know Metallica was right, you know, proof being in the result, Metallica was right, Napster, the, the ability to download music for free like this, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to kill the music industry, and it has, you know, like the music industry is not the same thing it was before that all happened, and that's not at all, that's, no. that's fact, um, whether they scream it from the rooftops like they should be or not, I, it's true, um, watch, uh, damn, what's that, doc? Artifact with Jay, Jay, Jay Leto, Jared Leto. Um, Jared, Leto also, yeah. Jared Leto is an actor. He also has a okay. band called 30 Seconds to Mars. Yes, he's also playing the Joker in a movie that's coming out called Suicide Squad that I am just like waiting to see this. This is going to be awesome, but go ahead. Uh, side note on that, uh, where, I, where I work, I got to see them in full costume. Is that right? <laughs> you saw the Joker? I saw Joker and Harley oh, right. Quinn, and uh, I don't remember the other character's name that was with them, but one of the other characters was with them. Anyways. Um, <laughs> The rabbit trails are always interesting, folks. Yeah. So Jared Leto put out a documentary called Artifact where he talks about the music industry and a lawsuit that he was in with the music industry for the fact that essentially he became slave to it. That they, they you know, you think that these artists are making all kinds of crazy money, but they're really not. It's, a, it's equating to a lot less than the average person thinks, and they become slaves to those industries. That's why you're seeing all of these different um, lawsuits going on, like even what Prince went through. Yeah. Just, you know, um, Michael Jackson. Had Michael Jackson. Race, you know, uh, Keith. I think is another one that's kind of popular mm -hmm. right now where she's like a recording contract, but like they, they lock you down and they, they won't let you do what you want to do and they won't let you do what you need to do. And they just, and sometimes they'll just make you sit there like a puppet. It's a, it's a really, it's a really broken and, and, and perverted industry. It always has been a little bit perverted, but I think it's really broken now. And it's a, uh, I don't know, as someone who aspires to be a, a performer, musician, like professional performing musician, there's not a lot of options to actually do so. Because you can't, there's, you can't make money off of it, you can't make a living off of it. You still have to work a full-time job and that takes away all the time that's required to make music and promote the music and everything else. And it's, it's not an industry anymore. It's, it's all gone. <laughs> it, um, you know, there was a cauldron, there was, uh, an environment that allowed for creative spurts in history. Um, if you go back into <clears throat> Middle Ages, uh, the patronage system, for instance, the aristocracy financing the artist. But then again, too, you wind up being somebody's bitch when you do this. It doesn't matter, does it? Yeah. It's the same system. And at the same time now, you know, conversely, there's incredible freedom to create music, but not on the scale of stadium level acts where a band just emerges like they did in the 60s and the 70s. And by the way, a lot of that was engineered as well. Um, and I know musicians and I've known some pretty big musicians in the trajectory that they took the deals that they made to get where they got to and the price that they had to pay. And some of them paid in blood for that. So, I mean, there's ritual and sacrifice that occurs in the music industry. An old story, somebody can go dig up the show where I talked about what really happened with Sid Vicious and Nancy Spungen at the um, <clears throat> hotel in New York City in, what was it, 1977, because I was three blocks away at the time. Um, <clears throat> there is 
there is this ritualistic aspect to the music music industry as well. But musicians like yourself do have the ability to create on a professional scale. And just look at the video we played, um, the music that you're creating, your band is yourself and basically a core two other musicians who play with you. Who are the other musicians in your band, by the way? Let's. Well, um, I, I, I kind of like to separate what I do in this field from them just because they don't, okay. they don't necessarily share all of my beliefs. Right. So, Got it. um, uh, not to say that they are very well aware of what I'm doing here. They have no issue with me promoting the band or sharing the songs while I'm mm-hmm. my podcasts or anything like that. They fully support what I'm doing in this Shane the Ruiner world, right? But um, I, I, I typically Separation. don't talk about it for that reason. So I just want to just want to state that off the record, but I will okay. answer the question. Um, they're 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 soulmates. To be honest with you, they're they're people that I have incredible personal connections with um not just them like there there's two other main members to the band of their brothers so it's and another one of their 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 third brother like there's there's three boys uh the third brother also sings on or raps on some of the songs along with me um their mother uh is someone i was also very close to their father has helped us out quite a bit too so it's uh it's you know it's family to me it's uh that's what i was looking close to for. Yeah, because the sense there is that this is a pretty tight group of people who create together. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you do want to hear my whole musical story. I'll sum sure. it up as quick as Go possible. Go for it. So it all started with a lie. I told a lie. <laughs> um, I said that I, I almost had a record deal with a musician, a very popular musician at the time. And I spread that all around a small town I lived in. My reason for this lie was to try and attract musicians. I was trying to find, I was trying to dig out, like it was a small town, I couldn't find anyone who played music, I was trying to find who did, and it worked. Everyone started coming to me being like, oh, I hear you can sing, oh, I can hear you can sing, oh, I hear you can sing, right? I could sing, but I had never been given the opportunity to show that in any kind of way, because there was no bands around to sing with. So my lie created a band, or found a band. I found a, a group of guys who were basically working together, but they didn't have a singer. Imagine that. And so I stepped in and I started singing with the band and the guitarist of that band. He also wanted to be a singer, but was still learning to sing, but also a very good guitarist. So the two of us ended up kind of becoming best friends and working together and um, had at, uh, a show that we did with that band, met a drummer that we were just blown away by. And the three of us ended up working together. We ended up recording a bunch of demos. And then it was this really interesting story where based on those demos, we were offered a show opening for a bigger band. And we didn't have a band. There was only three of us. So we literally just started calling up people we knew who could play instruments and being like, guys, we like, we need someone to play. We need someone to play. Found a, a bass player who had never played a bass before, but played guitar very well. <laughs> and um, a, a guitarist to come out and did it. We did our first shows. It's all history. Um, the other singer, the one that I mentioned that I that I first started the band with, he has a younger brother, and his name is also Shane. And he started eventually making music as well. And that is his songs are what turned into Unraveling. He had come to me and said, "Hey, I've got these these demos. I really like you as a singer. I would really like you to sing on them. Would you mind doing so?" So I wrote some lyrics. I did so, and then the next thing I knew, it was a whole album. And that was kind of, uh, there's another video where I say it in a pretty comical way, but it was, it was kind of almost like an, an accident. I didn't realize I was singing for all of the songs on the CD until it was almost done. And then I realized, mm-hmm. I was like, no, no, like you're the lead singer of this band. I'm like, oh, oops. <laughs> but that, that's kind of how that all came about. Um, just to kind of go back to that lie, I, I wanted to make it very clear that I confessed that lie. He is, uh, everybody is well aware of that lie. So it was, it was, um, it was useful for what it was for. I'm not proud of it at all. I'm just, uh, it, I, I was young when I did it and it, it was almost like a desperate measure to try and achieve something in my life and it worked. So, um, that was but my all reason. That aside for a minute, it kind of comes back to the manifestation thing. And that is that a lie is a creative fiction. Now, is it malevolent or does it serve a certain purpose? Do we not advance forward a fiction in order to come to a place? And I'm not advocating Mm -hmm. lying, 
But what I'm saying here is there's a real razor thin line between advancing an idea, declaring yourself a singer when you can sing. Yeah. Coupled to the idea that, okay, you weren't really offered a contract, but you were creating a reality stream that enabled something to come together. And, you know, it's not a rationalization. It is a creative fiction yeah. that we all it, do on some level. It wasn't something that they could hang on to either because it wasn't like it was a promise that, like, they were going to get a record deal. It was like yeah. one of those situations yeah. where if, you know, if I had if I had been able to at that time, I could have had a record deal, but I wasn't. But that's that's just how good of a singer I am, right? And, um Hey, I, I, I could sing. So I wasn't, you know, that part of it wasn't a lie. It was just uh, the association, which all it really got was attention. Like I said, nobody was benefiting or losing anything from it, right? Other than it got some people to pay attention and the right people. To well, by, to way of, by way of confession here, I will admit this. Back in the 90s, I mean, I was pretty good with computers. I, I pretty much grabbed computers right from the beginning, it's the, I was comfortable with it. Um, and I think everybody's padded a resume from time to time. I took a job to do an application development job on the premise that I could write code. Now, could I write code? Yeah, but application level, not really. I flew by the seat of my pants on that job. I basically got it done. I sat there with a code manual, I pulled snippets, I put this thing together. I stayed up all night figuring out how to fuse this code together because I had like modules and lines of code and, you know, text editors and everything in front of you trying to do this. I got through the project. Now, I wasn't what they thought I was, but I thought that I was good enough to be able to get to the place where I could sell my skills. That job led to me being offered a sales position that then took me on a whole other tangent towards the end of the 90s until the tech industry burned out. But, you know, we all have this within us, this, this component that's creating a reality. And we're just racing ahead of the reality. I mean, your recording contract really just hasn't shown up yet. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's funny that you went into the. It's funny that you went into a story about a resume because that's actually, like, once it was all confessed, that was actually what the band had said to me. It was like it's no different than lying on a on a resume. You know, you just yeah. it's you know it, it's no different than me saying that I was in five bands when really I was only in one. You know, it's uh, it's that that it was that harmless to them, I suppose, in the end. But. Um, <laughs> so how Anyways. long is how long has the band been together and a little bit of what you've done along the way and where you want to go? Well, un unraveling is almost like an extension of an, an another band called the Mindsight and I guess that started about 10 years ago now. And um when I say it's an extension, it's because like uh, the other singer from the first band is also in Unraveling. Um, when we play live, the the bass player from the first band is the bass player for that one. Uh, the drummer from the first band, as well as the bass player from the first band, played drum and bass on this record. So you know, it's it it really is kind of a it's all within the same family, just a, a different project. And uh, but when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, there's three of us. So um, yeah. Sorry, I forget. I think I lost your question in there somewhere. That's okay. No, what I was saying was you, you, you kind of wove into this. You've done two albums, is that correct? Yeah, with, uh, with uh, the first one we did two albums, and with this one we just released the second one, yeah. Great. And uh, with our music videos, um, I personally don't do it, but I know that the, uh, the other guys in the band, they put a lot of thought into it. Like, they, they obsess over it, and it's all... Especially the other Shane, like uh, he's very, in, very much into the artistic, like trying to convey some type of message through through what's what's there. It doesn't always come across. I mean, um, as an example, the Tangled Hope one. The the reason why the other girl is in that, she kind of looks similar to me, and the idea was supposed to be that that's like a male version and a female version of myself. Like my male side, my female side are kind of shown in that particular song with the way that the verses con uh, contrast or juxtapose with the choruses and then the, the bridge, which is also a whole different layer of dark, right? So um, that, that was what we were trying to portray in that way as well as the difference in the imagery. 
between it. And uh, it's funny because uh, the outdoor scenes, I liked that area so much that I moved there. That's an, it's an interesting uh, where you were shooting there. That's was that in Toronto? Is that? Yeah. Um, Which, by the way, Toronto. is a pretty big film city. There's a lot of locations in Toronto. I just watched video drone the other night and I was like, I've, I've been in every one of the buildings. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, just outside of Toronto Scarborough. It's just a small, mm. it, they call uh, the greater Toronto area, the GTA and Scarborough is part of the GTA. But it's uh, specifically called Guildwood. It's a very beautiful little area. If anyone ever goes to Scarborough, Ontario, check out the guild. It's uh, pretty. <laughs> And my understanding is that Toronto itself has a pretty booming music scene. I mean, sort of. A lot of a lot of bands get discovered here. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it is. That, bon Jovi got discovered here. Yeah, yeah isn't that weird? That's, that's not weird. A Jersey yeah. boy, and he winds up getting discovered there. Yeah, and I, if, if anyone's from Toronto is is listening to this, it's gut check time because Toronto fans suck. They're terrible they don't, <laughs> they, they don't enjoy watching live music unless it's like a big established band that they're already a huge fan of anyways but when they're out watching a new band there's no enjoyment they just they critique it's, they a, crit it's, a, yeah. it's a it's yeah, a very strange that. thing yeah. and and like um <laughs> stop it <laughs> that's all I have to say yeah, people, need to, people need to stop that people, like, you, you, if you don't like it you, you need to open yourself up to it if you're going to even enjoy it right? anyways right so maybe start there and if you're not enjoying it then, then shut it off but I don't know people's uh, we're going back to like digital music and the effects of that it's really hard to get people to listen to a full song. People listen to about three seconds of something. Yeah. And that's, that's it, you know? So um, that's another thing that we encounter as a band is like just even trying from a promotional aspect is just getting people to even try listening to it. You're not going to be able to really tell from three seconds whether or not you like a song, but we've gotten really used to that, I think, and, and people do it. So it's unfortunate. You know, isn't that weird? Because, you know, I have, I have kids all over the place. I mean, you know, I, could, I had four kids and they span like, like 20 years. But my youngest tells me that his generation does not listen to albums. I recently rebuilt and revived my analog stereo system. Two turntables, mixer, you know, all the different inputs, outputs, and a wall of vinyl. Someday I'm going to, I'll show people my record collection. Because this is a collection that I've been collecting since I was about 12 years old. And, um, but he's, it's, it's lost. He tells me it's lost on him the concept of an album. You know, to sit down, much less a concept album. Or an album that has a concept. Yeah. Um, and he's a musician. He's, a, he's an electronic. He's an electronic violinist. He plays electric violin. He plays drums, guitar, bass, mandolin. But to him, music is all about the song. And and he doesn't he doesn't quite grasp the concept that there is a th a thread that can run through music. I grew up in the in the generation post Sgt. Pepper's post dark side of the moon you know two conceptual albums and i have to wonder if that's dead or if there are bands i don't know the answer to this because i know some of the bands that are doing it is there is there an attention span left for communicating a concept that big in music shane i i want to say yes because i'm hopeful but um if i'm realistic i don't think so you know i don't uh I have a hard time with some younger people uh, even just explaining to them what a concept record really is, let alone getting them to actually sit down and try and listen to one. You know, it's, uh, it's, I think it's almost like a lost art form. Um, lots of things that got, got lost along the way. I mean, you don't buy physical CDs. You don't, I don't know. I used to buy a CD, come home and sit down yeah. with a CD and the artwork, yeah. you know, like we, we've lost that. We've, uh, yeah. It's just all so changed and it's all so different that I don't, I don't think so. I don't think that people have that kind of attention span for it anymore. I think that they're looking for something that's like a little bit more quicker or more instant gratification or bang for their buck or I don't know how to phrase that, but 
It's That's like a fun. sugar rush. Exactly. They, like they want the sugar yeah. rush. They don't want to sit down and savor mm -hmm. something that's textural and rich and has all these different facets to it. We, you know, and I remember doing this, scrutinizing album jackets. Even the etchings on the inside of vinyl records had messages in them. Yeah. <laughs> we played records backwards. Look, you know, that was yeah. the whole backward masking thing. That, that was kids my age discovering that these records had what we thought were coded messages. Were they coded messages? Well, you know, I have to tell you, studying that question and knowing the technology as well as I do, yeah, there were. Yeah, I mean, that, that stuff was put there, and some of it was quite supernatural. Yeah. So I've, I've, um, we did this experiment one time in a recording studio where we, we sang a passage and then we reversed it because you can do that real easy with mm -hmm. a digital movie. You can just make it, make it backwards. Just flip the loop. And then you teach yourself how to sing it backwards. Yes. You know what I mean, right? Like you teach and then you record that and then you reverse that and then you play mm -hmm. that forward. And it was funny. It was coming out like... Um, Um, like, had like a, it was just a, a fun little you think about back in the day, like all of the, the different things that could have been in that. Because I mean, even with tapes, you could play them and fast forward and pick things up in the chipmunk voice that weren't there well, on the record, right? And so. in fact, the, 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 the story behind the Beatles was that some of the reverse guitar parts that were in some of their earlier records, like Revolver, George Harrison actually did go in and play those parts as backwards by referencing the backward tape. They played the note for note backwards, doing a lot of what you were doing. Yeah. But obviously in Pro Tools, it's a hell of a lot easier to do than it was when you were working with four and eight track tape. <laughs> oh, for sure. But totally you know, different world. you're playing now in the ether, you know, which is a lot like, um, certain art forms where you, or, or, um, Certain writing forms as well. Um, I'm trying to think of the term for it right now, where you just put your hand down and you write. Um, Auto writing. Yeah, automatic writing. Um, people who write, and, and I've written all my, my whole life, poetry, verse, um, where you just allow yourself to flow onto paper or onto whatever your medium is. There are messages in that because we are free associating in the subconscious mind, we're pulling images. And a lot of times, this was one of the things that was so valuable to me was that I've kept journals since I was a young, well, young teenager, 12, 13, 14. Those journals have proved to be invaluable to me in going back and looking at what I wrote and sometimes looking at it and going, what the fuck was I thinking when I wrote that? And realizing that Something was buried there. Something was hidden there. That actually what we're doing a lot of times as creative people, we're leaving messages for ourselves. We're leaving a trail of breadcrumbs along the way. Yeah. That's part of the creative process. That's yeah, uh, kind of looking at a, a group of writings that's similar to that. But uh, there's, I used to write in specific spots all the time. And I, I realized at one point in time that in this one coffee shop I would go to, the theme was almost always the same. Right. And, and then I kind of realized something at that moment. I realized kind of what you do take in as an artist from the environment, you know, like you, the way that that, energy exchange with where you're at and, and everything go. I, I remember writing something based on that and calling it like the, the wall sing to me, right? Because it was like, uh, it was very similar to auto writing or maybe even channeling where I, mm -hmm. I was writing mm -hmm. out things that were yeah. not that they weren't my thoughts, but they just like it was structured differently than I normally would structure things. Or I was using words that I don't typically use. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I actually noticed it and I, re I recognized it or correlated it to the place I was writing. So there's, um, yeah, a lot of different things you can tap into. Um, I, I'm always reminded of the story of what was the man's name who wrote James Bond, Ian Fleming? Ian Fleming, yeah. Uh, how he found out later on that there was a, a spy that lived above him, right? And uh, he may have been channeling some of that information from said spy, right? Like he, everything, the 
amazing magical properties of our creative beings can pick up on everything that's going on in the ether and, and turn it into and transmutate it into something. Yeah. We do that. You know, if we, and I, I always try to remind myself of this and mention it to others that we need to notice things around us. There are, I do this as a practice. I, I have what's called hypervigilance where when I'm in certain places in certain situations, let's just say my antenna go up. And so I pay attention to details that other people don't necessarily pay attention to. Yeah. And as a result of that, I notice things that are odd, that are offbeat. Like, why is that there? What's the story of that object? What's the vibrational intensity of that object or the room itself? And, you know, I mean, part of being clairvoyant is actually pulling energy in from an environment. And then much like what you were talking about with, with telepathy, you get an image. Yeah. Image appears. And then, you know, the thing about it is most people dismiss those thoughts because they go by very quick. Mm -hmm. But the practice of mind of being able to capture that, and as a writer, I suspect you do this as well. You grab thoughts that fly by because they're poetic or they're meaningful or they have an attachment in some way. And you grab that and that becomes the seed for something that you then take and spin off into another direction. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, it's... Uh... Sometimes I'll I'll come up with I I remember I used to come up with a lot of my lyrics while I was walking and I'd have nowhere to write it down I didn't have a cell phone you know yeah. and or anything to put it down on so I would um I would create a musical hook out of it like a mm -hmm. uh, a tune that I would get stuck in my head and I would just keep repeating whatever the line was so you know what I mean what I, well, whatever part of it that I knew I needed to remember and I would do that all the way until I got to wherever I could write it down that was one of one of the ways that I would kind of grab and hold on to that but you're right it's um <clears throat> when with when you're talking about the speed that they flash by it it's almost like a dream you know mm -hmm. like if you really consider while you're dreaming it seems like it's taking like you feel like you're in real time right like everything is moving at a natural pace but in in reality that happened in 14 seconds you know so it's really where you're when those inspirations are passing you by it it's no different and um that's why like getting in the process of journaling is always really important because it yeah. get it gets you more used to writing those things down when they happen because a lot of the time you you kind of just assume that you're going to remember it oh i'll remember that later i'll remember that later no you won't you're gonna you're gonna sit down and go what right, was it exactly. that? Yeah. you know what i mean and and uh i do I this know. i carry these things with me yep. post-its <laughs> you can stick them in your pocket or your backpack or whatever you got with you. And it's amazing. I mean, I have to go through these things after a while and eventually transfer them or throw them out. And sometimes I look at them and I go, the fuck was I thinking when I wrote that down? And then I'll look at it again and I'll go, well, that's an interesting idea. Let's play with that a little bit. Yep. You know, and part of the point of this conversation that we're having is, um, I hope somebody out there who sees this gets inspired or we trigger something in them that's a creative process as well, because that's really where it gets interesting is when we're able to tap in and then we're able to be catalysts for other people's creativity. That's why we play in bands. That's why writers get together and have workshops. That's why artists in general sometimes band into communities as they've done over over historical times is because we're catalysts for each other in the collective and that is really where we come back to the beginning of this interview which was the necessity to allow enough grace that we're not complete to let others step in and kind of complete the dance and I'm mixing metaphors incredibly badly here. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's uh, it, being able to feed off of an inspiration and, and take that and, and make it something of your, something of your own, like take that and make it your own. 
it's, it's a beautiful feeling. Like it's a beautiful process and it's something that we need to, to develop the courage to do more of. Um, I guess a lot of, I think a lot of us are hiding. Um, a lot of us are kind of scared to show ourselves and we understand that once we, you know, if like myself as, a, as an example, like if you listen to my lyrics, you're going to learn a lot about me. You know, if you, if you watch me perform, you're, you're going to learn a lot about me. If you want, you know, if you take that in, you're, you're going to learn a lot about me. And that's because it's, it is my heart and soul that I'm pouring out there. And that's what artists do. You know, the, the bleeding hearted artist and uh, all these different phrases that have come out, they, they, they've come out of something. And, and all we're doing as artists is taking things out of the collective consciousness and, and painting a picture with them, right? We're using all that paint that is, is floating around out there and we're, we're painting pictures and, and we're not doing it to, I don't know, take anything from anybody. We're doing it to try and inspire people to see it for themselves because we've, we've noticed beauty in that. Yeah. I don't know. I remember when they used to paint like bowls of fruit and shit. <laughs> you know? yeah, people, yeah. people look at that now and they're like, well, why? Right. Well, that's because like someone looked at it one day and went, wow, like, look at, look at the way those shapes work together. Isn't that beautiful? The way the lights bouncing off of that apple, isn't that beautiful? I want to try and capture that and show it to someone. Yeah. So they so they painted it, right? Yeah. And usually they'd put some little twist or nuance on it if they were good. Yeah. Or they would do what beginning artists do, and they would use it as a launch pad into. I mean, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. You know, uh, I always wanted. You know, when I was taking art classes, my goal was to draw naked women, but I never got good enough with the human form to get the naked women to pose for me. So as a result of that, you wind up drawing bowls of fruit. Um, <laughs> balls of fruit you know the, the problem with the whole thing is that the rock and roll was always about one thing and that was getting laid anyway and really it's in some some ways never really gone too far from that it's kind of crude but yeah you know unfortunately <laughs> it's, 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 the, uh, it's it's where rock and roll was in the beginning that's what it was really all about but you know the art form itself is really mature in a lot of ways now and I, and, and, and I see it extending even more I you know just as an example the, your, the video we showed tonight in the show and some of the other things that down the road I'm going to do with this show in terms of bringing out more integration with the arts, with music, and, and things like that, are attempts to communicate beyond just the spoken word, the written page. Which, say, by the way, you do. Uh, you're doing a podcast. You have a blog. You're you're sort of a multimedia madman. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the uh, the podcasts and how that's progressing. Because I've heard some, not all of them. I've probably gotten maybe through about two thirds at this point. Very well, interesting for, stuff there. Great conversations. I just wish I could do more of it. It's uh, I, I don't have a lot of time, and I, I, it, it's uh, something I do as a hobby, so it's in my free time. I work a full-time job. I have other things to do. I, I don't have a lot of time to do it, but um, I would love to do one every day if I could because it's, it's, it's what I've been talking about here. It's all about trying to get everyone talking, like, you know, yeah. trying trying to – get rid of some of the division between us, get rid of some of the separation that we feel from each other and, and make, give everyone someone that they can relate to. I want to have, you know, people who have never talked about conspiracy theories before in their life, come on the podcast and just give their life experience on whatever that might be. Just, you know, I, somewhere in the middle between all of us is a sweet spot that we can find and we can, we we can move on together. I and into I I just don't see this race, this species being able to move any, being able to forward until they find it. And this is just a way of trying to help us do it within this small community. Yeah. It's by you know um, making everyone realize that you're all equally part of this community it's not just the ruiner you know it's not just it's not just whoever it's it's all of you and you've all got a story to tell so tell it you're you're you've all got brilliant insights so share them you've all got valuable information so share it and let's talk to one another and 
and and get along <laughs> and uh, you know see the beauty in our differences and learn how to appreciate that and figure out the places where we can unify and do that going even back to the beginning of this convert this this talk tonight <clears throat> the problem with the narrative controlling that we were talking about is the division that it causes you know um that's also the problem with the hopium selling is because you get so many people in an almost cult-like way so ravenous for that savior that they fight the people around them who question it and it causes division and that's the problem with it all if everything is kind of left open and and looked at as concepts and possibilities then we don't have reason to cause that that division you know you you are ex you're exploring something that i don't feel like i want to explore and it's just that simple there's no reason to fight with you about it we're both human beings let's let's see what we do agree on and what we can do about those things and, and start working towards solutions instead of creating camps and you know you, you've brought yeah. up the cv thing again like the the only problem i have with all of that is a lot of good people are now kind of on two sides of a fence that yeah. don't need to be yes. you know a lot I mean? of division a lot of hurt and all for what all for yeah. all for somebody getting their kicks out of making promises that they can't deliver on right like i'm sorry to be that blunt but that's really all that that is you know it i know it yeah um and it's 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 hurting people and that upsets me yeah it does <laughs> me too. i've seen the hurt i've seen the disappointment and um you know my message to the people privately and i do talk to some of them privately and even within sm small subgroups has been you have to turn this off you know you you really you know the interactions that we have are important let's not keep enthroning people yeah. We, we, if anything, what we're doing here tonight is disenthroning the media layer and bringing it back to a conversational level. You know, it, it's difficult because you and I are used to talking to each other and usually we're not visually connected to each other and we're not recording this for consumption by the so-called public. So, yeah. you know, it's not a completely natural conversation, but it is in the sense that there, we're not advancing agendas, we're not pushing ego, there isn't a whole lot of competition here, or this is my show, you're my guest, it's a conversation. And that's really what I've been trying to do for a while now, is to just create, destroy that layer, or that, that media layer. Media means the mediator, something that sits between you and something else. The, between the listener and the speaker is the truth and we're trying to come to that and the conversation is how we do it the interaction the respect the honor that we give each other even if the honor is when i finally have to tell somebody look you're being a total asshole here you're exploiting people you're deceiving them you're putting out bullshit so now we got to call you on it and at the end of the day if you absorb that and you act upon it honorably we have a path we can go down together as human beings. Shane, this conversation went by so fast and uh, you really actually wrapped it up in the last round there. Anything else you want to leave us with before we head off into the night here? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Um, yeah, it always fails you. Just, I, I don't know. <laughs> I've said it all before. Yeah. Everything you need to know, it's not like it, you, you can ask me questions. You can ask yourself the same questions. Mm -hmm. If you're going to ask me the question, please, please ask yourself the same question because you may have answers that I do not. And what I mean by that is trust yourself. Trust yourself. Believe that you're capable of trusting yourself because you are. Don't don't take all of this nonsense about oh my genetics have been manipulated and they're fucking with my food and they're messing with this and they're messing with that and I'm I'm completely powerless. No, you're not. You're powerful beyond all of that stuff. And as soon as you realize that and believe it, you'll manifest that into your own world to uh, bring us back to earlier in the conversation. It's true. I know that it's true. You don't have to believe me, but um, if you do believe me and you do apply it to your life, you'll you'll realize that it's true too. <laughs> That's it. You 
I yeah. love you all. Everybody's you're all beautiful, and uh, it's always fun talking to you. It's fun talking to you, and I love you very much. And I deeply appreciate the sacrifice of time you made to come out tonight to talk to us. That's going to wrap it up for this time. This is Off Planet TV, Off Planet Radio. The website is OffPlanetRadio.com. The truth is out there now. Go do something amazing. We'll be back real soon.